Uh, open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, picking it up in verse 17. Now, as he was going out on the road, this, of course, is Jesus, uh, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come. Take up your cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. In, uh, in Mark chapter 10, we've been uh, examining uh, what, you know, you look at Mark chapter 10 like a lot of things in the Gospel of Mark, and it just seems to be kind of a jumble of, um, of different things, you know, not necessarily related to one another, but they are. And uh, starting in chapter 10, verses 1 to 12, we were looking at attitudes in marriage um, and what Jesus had to say about that. Then we were looking at at uh, verses 13 to 16, attitudes in faith, uh, where Jesus is using uh, children as an example of the type or the kind of faith or the character of faith that he would have us have in him. And, and then we've got this young man that approaches him. And uh, just at you know the initial reading, when you look at this, <laughs> it seems like... Um, this is a young guy that's kind of got it all going. Uh, he had wealth, he had position, he had religion. And uh, so, you, you know, on one hand, and the disciples we're going to get to, I don't, I don't think we'll get to it tonight, but the disciples look at this and think, wow, you know, this guy's kind of got it all. You know, he's, what's wrong with him, you know? Um, but this young man knew that there was something missing. Uh, and he saw something in Jesus that compelled him to ask him. I, I just find that kind of fascinating. Uh, he had questions about faith, about his own faith, and, and he wanted to talk with Jesus about it. And what it boils down to, I think, is not what the young man expected. This is very true. Sometimes when you come to church, you come to Bible study, what you walk away with is not necessarily what you expected to receive when you first got there. You were thinking, gee, I could really use some, some encouragement. Instead, you know, I got rebuke, you know, or correction or something, you know. And, and, uh, and you never know. And, and we like to think that um, the Lord's in the things that we teach and that we say here. But that, of course, is no guarantee that everything I say is from the Lord or something. So, uh, you know, if it sounds weird, it's probably not him. Uh, I'm just saying. Uh, if it sounds funny and clever, that's probably me. Uh, if it convicts, if it converts, if it transforms your life, that's probably him. So here's this young man. And it's an interesting little piece of scripture. And like with many passages of scripture, if you really slow down and pay attention to it, that's it, yeah. Attitudes in, yeah, this is going to be attitudes and possessions. Or attitudes towards possessions. Thank you. Um, and, huh? <laughs> Thank you. And uh, so here's this young man, and, and I like, first of all, his approach. And, and his first approach, notice in verse 17, uh, now as he was going out, that's Jesus, of course, on the road, one came running and knelt before him. I like that. He's kneeling, and, and it's, it's an acknowledgement, too, not only with his words, but with his physical posture, he runs to him, he kneels before him, and he refers to him as good teacher. Now, he saw something, and he said something, and Jesus questioned him on it first. It's interesting, because when you look at this little thing, 
where he says, good teacher, uh, what shall I do, uh, or, or what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what do you call me good? A lot of people look at that and it's like, wow, yeah, that was kind of a weird thing to say. You know, why, why, would, why would Jesus say that? Uh, is Jesus saying he's not good? Is that what he's saying? Or why, why would he, he say that exactly? And, and there's a couple of things to think about. You'll read a lot of different opinions out there if you want to study that further. Um, I'll just give you uh, some things that I was thinking about. Um, uh, first, an interesting thing, I thought, is that historically, referring to this word good in relation to God, that word good uh, in Jewish history and in biblical history, that particular word is never used to refer to anything uh, except God. So there isn't anything that is good in this definition of the word good except for God. You can look at man and say, well, you know, he's a good man, but it's not the same word. In other words, why would this man refer to Jesus as good because nobody at that time, certainly nobody that was Jewish, would ever refer to a human being as being good. Uh, God created the world and every time he created something he called that good, that's back in Genesis chapter one and all those verses, verse four, 10, 12, 18, 21, 25. And in verse 31, he called his creation very good. But apart from that, um, nobody referred to anything as, as being good except for God, at least in this context, in this use of the word. So when this young man runs up to Jesus, kneels in front of him, and refers to him as good, Jesus' response amounts to, I think this, Jesus' response is, um, are you sure that that's what you mean. When you call me good, are you? do you understand what you're saying when you call me good teacher? It's as if Jesus is setting the basis for what he is about to say. In other words, if you're referring to me as good teacher, you get that square in your head. You understand what that means to refer to me as good teacher, and then remember that when I give you the answer. Sometimes I think um, when we pray or when we go to God's word, a lot of times you've heard me say this before, what we're looking for is we're looking for a rubber stamp. We want God to bless whatever it is that we do. Lord, this is what I'm about to do. Now approve it for me and bless it. And, and frequently, uh, you know, I think God is saying, no, no. You know, I'm not going to bless that. I'm not going to approve that because you're doing something, going somewhere with someone that I would never, ever approve for you. That's not what I have for you. That's what you've chosen for yourself. I'm walking this way. You're walking that way. I'm not going to bless it. And then we wonder why things don't go the way that we think that they ought to. Why every single one of my relationships is a disaster. You know, how come I can't ever seem to make any progress in my spiritual life? I keep asking God to bless it, and he never does. Well, maybe you need to get to where the blessings are. You've heard me say this a zillion times. You're probably sick of it. Um, if you want to get wet, you got to stand under the spigot. That's where the water comes out. And if you're not under the spigot, you ain't going to get wet. And if you're not walking where Jesus wants you to walk, you're not going to get blessed. It just it ain't going to happen. Why would he? Why would God bless you if you're doing something he doesn't want you to do? Or if you're doing something that he's told you specifically, don't do that. Okay, that's a sin. Don't do that. But you're doing it all the time, and you're asking me to bless your life. Hello? Hello? <laughs> it's like, why would we think that he would do that uh, if we're not going to do what, what he wants us to do or what he's already commanded us to do? You know, you're, you want to do all this other stuff, but you still haven't done all this other stuff that he already told you to do. I don't know what to do with my life. Well, he told you to do all of this stuff. Well, I don't want to do that stuff. I want to do this stuff. Well, <laughs> you know, what do you, what do you think is, is going to happen? So when, when Jesus says, when Jesus says to him, you know, why do you call me good? No one is, uh, no one is good but one, and that is God. 
So we can, we can look at this statement and we can say, look, you're saying that I'm good, only God is good. Do you understand what you're saying? You know, a lot of people see in this, and I do too, an affirmation of the deity of Christ. It's like this young man is calling Jesus God, and Jesus is saying, do you, do you understand what you're saying? So it's, it's like Jesus is saying, if you think I'm your good teacher, let's see if you really believe that. Fo follow along with me here, and, and, let's, and let's see how this plays out. Okay, young man. Notice that this young man has great possessions. Verse 22 says that. Uh, it says he had great possessions. Uh, but he was also a very religious young man, very zealous to obey. Verse 20, Jesus rattles off a string of commandments. It's interesting. They are not all the ten. There are some. Uh, and it's interesting because they're usually the ones that, or they are the ones that uh, pertain specifically to our behavior towards other human beings. It's like Jesus intentionally skipped the part about our relationship to God. And he says, these are the things, that, that these are, you know, the the commands that uh, deal with our relationship with other people. So Jesus says, okay, you know these. And the young man says, all these I have kept. So I've done all of this stuff. I haven't, you know, what, is it, what does he say? Uh, Jesus says, uh, don't commit adultery. The young man says, got it. I haven't committed adultery. Uh, do not murder. Good. Haven't murdered. Uh, do not steal. No stealing. Um, do not bear false witnesses. Never done that before. Do not defraud. Haven't done that. Honor your father and mother. Got it. So this young man was able to go down the list and tick every box. That's awesome. I would like five. <laughs> yeah. I got these. I'm good on these. No, he was probably like five years old. Oh, like five years old? <laughs> Yeah, because by the time you hit six, it's over. Murder, yeah, murder, steal, adultery, the whole thing. Um, but just the fact that he approached Jesus, he tips his hand. Just the fact that he approached Jesus. In other words, he would not be asking Jesus this question if he was confident in his own goodness. I've already done all of this stuff. And in fact, in spite of being able to tick all the boxes and say that he had done all of this stuff, he knows something is missing, otherwise he wouldn't be asking. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, there's something about rule keeping that appeals to human beings. Virtually every religion in the world, apart from what I would describe as biblical Christianity, is about rule keeping. It's about do this, 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 and this, and then you'll get whatever it is that we promise you, whatever that may be, whatever they're promising. So we love to tick all the boxes. We love to have a set of rules and then say, okay, I am going to keep all of these rules, and we like it. But while it appeals to our human nature, it also ultimately cannot fulfill us. We want rules to keep, but even in keeping them, we fail. Why? Well, first of all, because we have pride in keeping them. All these I have done since my youth. In, back in Matthew chapter 23... Jesus, uh, what am I, Matthew 23, 23. Jesus describes this attitude like this. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay the tenth of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. See, one thing that happens with rule keeping is it makes you a Pharisee. I've kept all the rules, but you miss the whole point of the rules. You miss the, the reason why the rules are there. 
So in, in ticking all the boxes, in keeping all the rules, it will make you prideful. It will make you a Pharisee. I have kept all of the rules. How about you? If you haven't kept all the rules and I have, that means I've done better than you have. Right? So now I'm a Pharisee. But there's something else about rule keeping too. And it's uh, what I've described here in my notes as a nagging internal question. And that is, have I done enough? Smart girl. Have I done enough? I remember um, reading uh, somebody had interviewed Mother Teresa, who being Roman Catholic, of course, would not have any assurance at all. And they asked her, you know, are you going to go to heaven when you die? And she said, well, I hope so. And I thought, well, well, God bless her work. You know, that's awesome. You know, I'm very, very impressed by, by her work and, and wish there was more people doing that kind of work. But to have no assurance. And the great thing about the assurance that we have in our salvation is it doesn't have anything to do with how much good work we do right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah to that. See, with rule keeping, you never have assurance because you never know if you've done enough. You know, even with uh, other monotheistic religions like Islam, you never know if you've done enough good to warrant God's mercy. You never know. You just hope that you have. And, and in a, the obvious forms of Islam that we hear about all the time, there are certain ways that they can guarantee that they'll achieve heaven in their definition, but that is something that has to come about with great violence. So the Christian then is the only one that has assurance because the beauty of the gospel is, is that we rely not on what we've done, we rely on what he did. No one comes to the Father but through me. He didn't say no one comes to the Father unless they've done enough good stuff. No one comes to the Father except through me. I refer to this passage a lot in Hebrews chapter 10 because it does such a beautiful job of describing our entrance into God's presence, which we now exist in. As a Christian, you exist in this life where you're continuously uh, cognizant that you are in the presence of God and you are never out of the presence of God. The unbeliever is in the presence of God. They just don't know it. But for the believer, we know it. You know, we, we, we pray this way and I pray this way too. You know, Lord, we just come into your presence now. No, 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 no. You're always in his presence. It's, it's more a question of, Lord, now I'm turning my attention towards you because I acknowledge that I'm always in your presence. But in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 22, God's word describes our entrance into this state where we acknowledge and recognize and are cognizant uh, every moment of every day that we exist in the presence of God, that we have this immediate access into the very throne room of grace and it's described like this therefore a brethren having boldness to enter the holiest remember in the tabernacle or in the temple the holiest was the place where the ark of the covenant was kept and that's where the high priest would meet face to face with god now that way in to the holiest god's presence has been opened and the interesting thing is not only is it opened, but you and I have the opportunity to enter boldly. Now, I am more likely in my own state of heart and mind to crawl on my face. And, and it's almost as if God's saying, I don't need penance. I don't want penance. You know, I don't need that kind of um, obeisance. I don't need that kind of self-flagellation. I opened the way for you. Now get in here. Get, in, get up and get in here. 
because we have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a great high priest over the house of God, that's Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I love the picture that comes from his forgiveness uh, of cleanness, cleanness. And, and, you know, mom, you know, mom, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. And it's more like godliness brings cleanness. You know, surrender to Christ, he cleans us. And how many people think, okay, well, you know what? I'll, you know, I'll go to church when I, when I get over this or when I get past this or when I deal with this, then, you know, I'll go to God. And it's like, they, you know, it's completely backwards. You know, I'll, I'll go to the hospital and I'll get an operation and I'll get medicine once I get well. <laughs> well, you know, you're missing something here. <laughs> and, what you're, and what you're missing is the fact that it's entirely on the basis of what he has done, not on anything that we do. Now, this young man, back in Mark chapter 10, Here's the hang-up with this young guy. He wants to know how to go to heaven. He believes in eternity. He believes in God. He believes in the law. But in spite of his performance, he is troubled, so he asks Jesus. And it might be at this point that he's waiting for Jesus to say, well, if you've done all of this, you're, you're golden. You're good to go, pony boy. You're in there. Don't worry about it. No sweat. But Jesus doesn't. As a matter of fact, Jesus doesn't say that at all. Instead, Jesus tells him to do the very thing that he really doesn't want to do. Now, that's kind of fascinating because remember, this young man came to Jesus. So obviously there was something in there. In spite of his wealth, in spite of his religion, in spite of his zeal in, in adhering to the rules and regulations of his religion, you know, there was just something that wasn't setting right with him. Something that he felt. And so he went to Jesus, maybe looking for approval. Yeah, just, just tell me I'm good. Just tell, that's all I want, just tell me that I'm good. Boy, I wonder how many churches in America today exist solely for the purpose of telling people that they're good. You're good, you're good, you're better than good. You're awesome. <laughs> You just, you know, you just don't know it yet. You just don't realize how awesome you are. It's funny because, you know, when, when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you finally give up the fight and you surrender your life to him, you know, you do so, I did anyways, in almost complete ignorance of what that meant. I, I really didn't understand what I was doing. I didn't understand the full ramifications of what I had done. And we like to say, well, you know, you can't be a Christian unless you believe that Jesus is God. And, uh, you know, that uh, the incarnation, uh, you know, he died this propitiatory death that we might now be reconciled. But, you know, if you don't believe, you can't, you can't be a Christian. And I'm like, you know, I had no clue what any of that stuff was. I was sitting in church. I'll tell you the story again. I was sitting in church because I went there for somebody else because I wanted to make sure they weren't into some weird thing and I sat there and in one brief shining moment my epiphany I sat there and I listened to the preacher and I thought everything I believe is wrong everything and I don't want to be wrong that was it that was, that was the whole thing I didn't know 
anything about Jesus being God or reconciliation or propitiation or righteousness through faith. I didn't know any of that stuff. I just, I'm wrong and I don't want to be wrong. Now, yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Uh, but from that point on, I began learning. And then I started reading things in here that for the very first time in everything that I'd ever studied, and at the time, you know, I don't want to say that I was part of the Religion of the Month Club, but I was into a lot of different things, most of them Eastern, a lot of Eastern philosophy, Eastern mysticism that ran the gamut from you know, psychedelic experience to transcendental meditation to all kinds of different sorts of things. I was not worried about my spirituality, not concerned about it at all. I was not in crisis emotionally, mentally, spiritually, or anything else. I was fine as far as I was concerned. But then I started reading, and for the first time in my life, in everything that I'd ever read or ever, ever studied about anything, I finally found a description of myself that, that fit. It worked. I started reading this, I started reading God's Word, and all of a sudden it's defining me as a human being. And it fit to a T. Not only the things that I was doing that were contrary to God's will, but the things that I was kind of on the border of, and I just needed to take that next step over. And all of a sudden, this starts making an enormous amount of sense to me for the, for the first time ever. Now, this young man has got all of this going for him, and yet something is wrong. Now, my life subsequent to my salvation for the last, um, when was that? 30, thir 35 years, thank you. 30 <laughs> I go to public school. <laughs> um, 35 years, over 35 years now, that I've been um, crawling with the, walking with the Lord, um, what I find he does a lot, and he does to this young man right here, is he sticks his finger right in the very middle of the problem that I refuse to acknowledge. Out of everything that's going on in my life, the place where he sticks his finger is the very place where I don't want anybody sticking their finger. Now, that's kind of interesting to me because he doesn't say anything in here about all of this stuff that you're doing is great. Good job. Glad you're doing all of this stuff. The first thing that he points out is one thing you lack. See, this young man had everything. He had wealth, he had religion, he had performance, exemplary performance within his religion. All these things I have kept from my youth. I got everything. And Jesus says, no you don't. This one thing you lack. Have you ever had, maybe you're reading God's Word or reading a book about God's Word or you're in conversation with another Christian or your church or Bible study and something goes into your skull a word, a song, something and you are instantaneously reminded of something that you know is in your life that shouldn't be. Could be a behavior, could be a relationship, could be something that you're not doing that you should be doing. Could be something that you're doing that God doesn't want you to do. Could be a lot of things. And God just sticks his finger right in it. And says, all of this other stuff that's going on in your life, it's not the point. None of that stuff is the point. This right here, this is the point. 
this is what I want to deal with right now. You are so concerned, so concerned about so many different things. You got work and you got relationships and you got school and you got kids and you got parents and you got all of this stuff going on. But this one thing is the one thing that I want to deal with right now. And, and you say, nah, <laughs> nah. You know, I, I don't know. I, you know, I pray to the Lord, but I never hear from him. <laughs> you just did. But you didn't like that. And so because we didn't like it, therefore that's not him. Because God is not rubber stamping my agenda, therefore I'm not hearing from God. God is not blessing my life. So he tells this young man, one thing that you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor. Okay, now, a lot of people have used this to say, well, Christians should not have anything. Well, th that's not it. Jesus isn't condemning wealth by any stretch of the imagination. God's word never condemns wealth. But the thing that he is poking his finger in here is that it's far worse to be possessed by your possessions than to have possessions. What is it? What is it that may be holding you back from wholly and completely following Jesus. What is it? <laughs> it's up to you guys, not up to me. You you figure it out. Because um, what Jesus goes on to say is the thing that's holding you up, speaking of this young man, is you're possessed by your possessions. So what you have to do, you have to get rid of the one thing that's holding you up and you have to surrender your life to me. Because you're not. Take up your cross, follow me. And everybody seems to think, I know we've talked about this here before, so you guys probably don't think this, I don't know. A lot of people think, well, you know, take up your cross, that means I've got a burden that I have to bear. No, that's not what it is. Cross is not a burden to bear, cross is a place to die. That's what the cross is. You go to the cross to die. And Jesus says you got to die to yourself so you can follow me. Now that's interesting too on a lot of different levels. And I think we could probably contemplate that for a long time and never get the full importance of it. What it means to die to self. Because the possessions in this case of this young man, the possessions possessed the self. He was self-possessed, if you will. And Jesus says, I want to set you free from that, but it requires ridding your life of the very thing that is possessing you, dying to yourself that is currently possessed by your possessions, so that you can freely, without any encumbrance, Follow me. See, I think, I think a lot of us, what we do is we treat Jesus as an add-on. We treat Jesus as an add-on. I've got my life, and I just added Jesus onto my life. So now that I can be a Christian, I can go to heaven when I die, and Jesus will make me a better person now. So we treat Jesus as an add-on. And when we do that, we do him a grave disservice. It's almost like what we really want is we want a good luck charm. That's what we really want. You know, I want, I'd rather have a genie in a bottle than a, a dying resurrected savior. Because a, a savior that died on the cross and ro rose from the dead again, he, he'll bug you. I, I sometimes think that that's why some people, and I'm not criticizing you if you do, um, but some people like the crucifix. They like the image of Jesus nailed to the cross. And, and sometimes, I think, I don't know, I could be completely off base here, but I think people like Jesus on the cross because if he's on the cross, he can't bug you. <laughs> he's dead up there. What's he going to do? How is he going to interrupt your life or bug you in some way? We just want to be able to go up there and just touch it 
and get the magic power that comes from it. We just want to wear it on a chain around our neck so that we can have a force field around us when we go out in life and do whatever it is that we do. But if you've got a resurrected Savior, that's trouble. Because he's alive and living and he's coming for you. And he's going to stick his finger right in the middle of the very thing that you do not want him to stick his finger in. He's a pest. I've described him sometimes, you know, as Jesus moves in and takes up residence in our heart. He's the worst possible tenant. Because the minute he moves in, he starts tearing the place apart, man. He's, he's like, <laughs> up comes the carpet. He's thrown out the sofa. It's like, I love that sofa. You know, I, that's the, my favorite sofa. I'm comfortable on that sofa. And, you know, it's like, he's, so he's tearing out everything. And you're like, okay, okay, I know this is going to be better. I know this is going to be better. And he finally gets to your bedroom, the closet door that you have locked. And that's where he wants to go. And you're like, not the closet. And he's like, yeah. And you're like, no, 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 no. Because in there is my deepest, darkest secrets. In there is my pain. In there is my shame. In there is my humiliation. All the things that I've done. In there is all the things that have been done to me. Throughout my life. Perhaps when I was innocent and could not defend myself perhaps just stupid things that I've done. I've stored all of those in that closet and nobody go. I don't even go into that closet. Because if I go into that closet, it overwhelms me. I can't deal with it. So I shut that closet and I lock that door, not realizing that everybody that comes to my house can smell the stench that's coming from that closet. But nobody knows why. Nobody knows why, what that smell is. Nobody knows why this is such an uncomfortable place to be. I don't even know why this is such an uncomfortable place to be. I can't even be alone with myself because there's something uncomfortable about it. Jesus says, it's that closet, and that is where I want to go. Hmm. I don't know what it is. I don't know what we think is going to happen. I, I know you guys know me. I hate medical procedures of any kind. I have a, I wouldn't necessarily call it a phobia, it's more like a nausea <laughs> of any kind of medical thing. Anything that involves a needle, a scalpel, a tube, a hose, a mask, any kind of medical thing, it just freaks me out. And uh, all of those kind of fears and phobias don't have to do with the fact that this is going to help me. I get that. I'm afraid of the procedure. Not the good that it's going to do me. So we know that if Jesus is going to go into that closet, we know that needs to get dealt with. We know everything in there needs to get dealt with, right? We know that you know, I'm on the wrong path here. I'm in the wrong relationship here. I've got a bad habit here. I've got all of this baggage from my past, all these issues in my life. I know all of that stuff, and I know it's all there, and I know that it needs to get dealt with. I even know that he's going to deal with it. I'm just afraid of how he's going to do it. What's he going to do to me to get me past all of this stuff? And for me, I'll tell you my last big medical procedure. I had uh, this gum transplant surgery. I don't know if you guys have ever had this before. It was amazing. I never heard anything like it before because I got this receding gum lines because, you know, I brush with a steel brush and I floss with barbed wire. And, and so my, my, my dentist is like, your gums are receding. I said, my, you know, my, my hairline is receding, you know, can you, you know, fix that too, you know? And, and so he's, he's like, okay, well, we got this procedure now where they can actually add tissue on and you'll grow new gums. And I'm like, that's cool. And so I go and see this oral surgeon who happened to be his cousin. I don't know what is that or some kickback thing there. And she says, yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to add more tissue on there and it's going to grow there. You'll have gums like you were 18 years old. I'm like, that's awesome. And then she told me where she was going to get the tissue from. 
she says, we're going to cut it out of the roof of your mouth. And I'm like, <laughs> don't tell me that. It's like, oh, you're going to like, you're going to carve this gaping hole out of the roof of my mouth and suck tissue out of my brain and fill it. You know, it's like, and I'm like, can't you, can you take it from somewhere else? Like, I got plenty right here. Take all of this. You can fill in all of the gums with all the, you know, it's like, take, some, take it from somewhere that will give me a benefit. It's taken it out of the roof of my mouth. I know I'm belaboring this point. So one of the things that they did, these people are brilliant. She gives me this, this gummy ball in my hand. She, yeah, no, she says, she, she says, just while we're doing the procedure, just work this, this ball. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> whatever, okay. Man, I just worked that ball the whole time. And, and let me tell you something. It went really well. And, I mean, it was almost like, surprisingly, like a cakewalk. And the, the post procedure thing they're like okay well here's what it's going to feel like you know we've got these painkillers and everything it was like it was a piece of cake and then you know I got to go back they got stitches all over my mouth and it's like we got to go in and take those on I'm thinking oh god they got to you know, yank these big pieces of rope out of my skull you know and that's you know she's got a foot on my forehead yeah, pull that stuff out and I'm like, oh, God. you know, I'm sweating, I'm white, you know. And she's like, plink, 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 done. That's it. Done. Done. The whole thing went so good. So what was the problem? What was the problem here? Well, the problem was me twisting myself into a knot over what I thought might happen, which actually never happened. And so I look back in, in retrospect and go, what a wimp. Man, it was so easy. Okay, look, friends. Obviously, I'm trying to make a point here, and I'm making it even longer. We get so afraid of what God's going to do. We get so afraid of how he's going to do it. Why? Why do we do that? It's, it's God that we're talking about, our Heavenly Father, our beloved, Jesus who died on the cross for all of our sins and rose again, now dwells in our heart by faith. Why are we afraid of his procedures? We understand that the outcome we love the outcome. We can't wait for the outcome, but we're afraid of the procedure. In Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul describes some of this procedural stuff. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, he says, But what things were gained to me, in other words, the things that he valued in his life, these I have counted loss for Christ. So these things that I count dear, these things that are important to me, special to me, work, money, possessions, relationships, these things that, I, that are special to me, if you want them, take them. Take whatever you want from my life anything yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ see Paul's got a hold of something that I don't think we do and that is perceived values perceived values see he sees anything that Christ would give us would be far surpassing the value of anything I currently possess so anything that he wants to take he could take it all as the apostle Paul says he can have everything in my life take it all away and all I need is just to know him. That's enough. Nothing else even matters. 
possessions, relationships, goals, aspirations, careers, whatever it may be, none of it can hold a candle to what he gives me. So if he wants to take it all, he can have it all. He also says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8, another secret that's behind this, He says, and having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. See, Paul understands the difference between a need and a want. I don't. I'm telling you that straight up. I don't. The things that I think that I need, I'm, I'm ridiculous. See, the Apostle Paul discovered that contentment was whatever it is that he supplies. That's contentment. Whatever he supplies is contentment. We got goals, don't we? We got goals. And look, look, there's nothing wrong with trying to achieve our goals. Nothing wrong with having ideas and pursuing those ideas. Nothing wrong with wanting to succeed at whatever it is that we do. But at the expense of what? And are we really achieving what we want? Now, you guys know, too, I've been a business owner twice. And that's really what I wanted to do. I really wanted to do that. And, and the Lord let me do it. And in the first case, it didn't go all that well. In the second case, it was an unmitigated disaster. Now, gee, Lord, thank you very much for letting me fail so miserably. And it's, it's like God saying, well, you wanted to. What are you blaming me for? You wanted to do this. You know, you didn't even really ask me. You just said, I'm going to do this, now bless it for me, which is exactly what I did. Lord, I'm going to do this. It's my goal. It's my idea. I want to do it. Awesome. Go ahead. Go ahead. But when it didn't go the way that I wanted it to go, what was my option at that point? Lord, are you, did I rush out ahead of you? Are you in this or are you in this? Nah, nah, that wasn't it at all. I wheeled and dealed and finagled another way to go which is what ended in a mid unmitigated disaster. Here's a, the short point being belabored by me. Jesus is not commanding the young man to get rid of everything. He's commanding the young man to get rid of everything that is keeping him from following Jesus. That's what he's commanding him. Now, does that seem impossible to you? Does it seem impossible to be rid of everything in your life that would prevent you, slow you down, or hinder you from following Jesus? What is it that possesses you? What are you possessed by? And are the things that possess you hindering your walk and relationship to Jesus? Are they slowing you down, stopping you? Are you off course somewhere? Again, are you involved in a behavior that you should not be doing? Are you not doing something that you should be doing? Is it a relationship? Is it a job? What is it? What is it? Examine your own heart. Pray and ask God. Believe me, he'll, that, he'll answer that prayer. <laughs> Lord, show me what it is that's holding me back from following you. Oh, that's enough. That's not that's enough. It's too much already. You ask yourself. You pray. Lord, what is it that is possessing me, that is holding me back from wholly and completely following you? Jesus isn't asking us to give up everything. He's just asking us to give up anything that would keep us from following him fully, wholly, completely, and sacrificially. You know, I just love this topic. It's just tonight because the um, the idea of stewardship mm -hmm. has been a very prominent part just in the past few weeks in my life. Mm -hmm. And again, today it came up in a fantastic sermon I was listening to. And Not this one. <laughs> yeah. <Earlier>. yeah, okay. <laughs> so, this is the dessert. Yeah, okay, good. Thank um, you. A, a meaty. Right, thank dessert. you. Dessert. Yeah, dessert. yeah. Dessert. I got it, yeah. <laughs> That'd be gross. But anyway, um, but in, in just because it's an easy one and thinking about money, like thinking about what 
yes, the Lord is asking for everything from us. But at the same time, picking money because it's an easy one, right. um, and thinking about a tithe, it, that's something I've been struggling with, is mm-hmm. tithing. Sure. And just him drilling it in today is, all he's asking for is 10%. Mm-hmm. And he's willing to give us 90 and we're Mm -hmm. and so and thinking about that in terms of just everything is and him sticking that that finger in there it's like well I mean all he wants it starts with the heart Mm -hmm. if we're not willing to give that 10% whether it is our money or our time and so the whole point was you say I can't afford it. I can't afford the ten percent. I can't afford the time. I can't afford to give up that relationship. I can't afford to to give up this job or whatever it is that he's sticking his finger in. That's like saying, you know, Lord, I love you, but not enough for me to be inconvenienced by this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or yeah. I can't. I love you, just not that much. But I'm not. <laughs> This is too much to ask. Right, so, right, right. And that's, and it's just, it's so convicting because it's like there's so many other areas of my life where I'm like, here. Yeah. But then you look at other things and it's like, yeah. Really? This one? Yeah, I got, I got a buddy of mine that's a assistant pastor of Calvary Chapel down in Southern California. And he was talking with his wife about a thing just like this until his wife just just off the cuff she just goes she just looks at him and says what else won't you do for Jesus right and it's like <laughs> right we like to say you know there's there's nothing that we wouldn't do for Jesus oh yeah there's plenty plenty we wouldn't do for Jesus uh, because yeah we don't want to be inconvenienced we're afraid of the procedure you know we're afraid of what he's going to do gee if I give this up I won't have it anymore and Jesus no no he, you'll be able to have an open hand to receive something else. You know, my philosophy has always been, you know, Jesus, he, he doesn't get 10%. He gets 100%, yeah. you know. And the big question is not how much am I going to give him. The, the real question is how much do I need to get by? And uh, I don't need a lot, you know. makes me think of, I don't know if you've seen that cartoon where there's a little girl, and she's got a stuffed animal, and Jesus, like in the, fi- in the figure of a dad, has the same stuffed animal, but like 10 times bigger behind his back. Yeah. And the girl's clutching it saying, but I love it. Yeah. And God's going, just holding it behind his back, just trust him. Yeah, it. yeah. And it's, yeah, I didn't I didn't see, mine, mine's more like, you know, I'm on a tricycle and God's got a 1969 uh, Mustang Mach 1 behind his back. <laughs> And he says, you know, I'll trade the tricycle for the for the Mustang. That's more, you know. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's pray. Um, Lord Jesus, we're, we, Lord, it's easy, and we and we laugh, and we like to make jokes because it makes us uh, release the tension from considering what it is that possesses us and what it is, Lord, that you want us to leave behind so that we can move forward. Lord, help us not to be afraid of the procedure, Lord, but to keep our eyes on the value of things. Lord, that the the value of the things that you possess that you have for us are so much greater than the value of the things that, that possess us, the things that we want to hold on to. So set us free tonight, Lord. Uh, settle these things in our minds that we might be able to, uh, even this night, Look at these things and say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm ready for you to, to open the door to that closet. I'm ready for you to start dealing with this stuff. Lord, help us to be willing to go there, not afraid of the procedure, but keeping our eyes on the healing and the freedom that comes on the other side. And uh, so we look to you, Lord, and we trust you. We say that with our words. Now, Lord, let us trust you with our lives and everything concerning that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.